Hello, everyone. I know that there are still people filtering in and people having their breakfast conversations. And some, for some reason, people are very afraid to sit up here near me. I, I'm not sure why. But we'll, anyone else who comes in will have to sit here. Uh, good morning. I'm Diana Samarison. I'm the founding director of the Disability Rights Fund and the Disability Rights Advocacy Fund. Yesterday, um, we set the stage for today's and tomorrow's discussions by looking back at the American experience of the Americans with Disability Act and by learning some basics about the international framework for the rights of persons with disabilities, the Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities. Our new topic today, which is civil society using the new politics of disability case studies on innovative advocacy around the world, builds on yesterday's learnings. Before we get started, though, I wanted to let you know that we've had a switch in the program. Um, Apollo Mukasa, who was to speak this morning, missed his flight and will be arriving later. So we've switched what was going to happen after lunch to this morning and what was going to happen this morning to after lunch. Um, so we will be starting with amplifying the voice of civil society through national human rights institutions and with the speakers Elizabeth Camundia, Valentin Aichele, and Professor Gerard Quinn. And then after lunch, we'll return to the speakers who were supposed to be here this morning, Catalina Devandas, Apollo Mukasa, and Yeni Damayanti. Um, but before we get started with all of our discussions of the day, we have a half an hour to gather some key learnings from yesterday's breakout sessions. And I understand there are four rapporteurs from those breakout sessions. Do we have any of those rapporteurs in the room? One. We have one. Two. Two rapporteurs. OK. Um, we, uh, three, three rapporteurs, excellent. So is there a group one rapporteur? You are. Uh, could you, I see you have a presentation. Uh, <laughs> okay, do you wanna come on down and, and give us in only two minutes or less um, some key learnings from your group? Thank you. Okay. Right, okay. Thank you, I'll try to make it short. Um, so we had two categories of feedback, um, of um, bullet points basically. One was uh, technical, uh, practical issues, and the other was um, content related. The first was um, uh, more time for questions. Um, feedback from questions, if they could be given one by one, rather than after a collection of questions. And then um, also if the questions could be uh, recapped by the, the person answering the question. Um, so that was more kind of a design suggestion of the way um, sessions are structured, uh, the, the, the feedback question. Uh, somebody was asking for clarity on readings um, and um, sending out the link to the um, Dropbox or OneDrive, uh, OneDrive um, yeah, deposit box. Um, and then on the content relati related questions, um, um, somebody asked for um, some discussions around um, the general comment on Article 12, for example, and the implications on its effectiveness and how uh, the general comment as a tool or committee discussions and the uh, working group discussions as, uh, can be used to, as tools to counteract ambiguity in the Convention's understa understanding the Convention. Um, we talked about the impact of the UNCRPD on the ground and, um, and how to boost the civil society presence in treaty monitoring system. Um, and, and also discuss, we discussed the ratification of the optional protocol uh, in order for the UN Convention to be more tangible. Um, and also whether or not the ICCPR mechanism was more effective um, in its... Um, impact 
Um, and also uh, the, the group discussed engaging with other civil society bodies uh, to, to enhance learning and also how to how do we link our learning from here and beyond into tangible results. Okay, thank you. Thank you. That was quite a list. Um, who was the rapporteur for group two? So, my name is Pia Justison. I'm a non-discrimination lawyer from Denmark, currently living in the US. And we had a lot of very interesting discussions in group number two. And obviously I can't cover everything, but I'll cover some substance issues. So we talked about the link between poverty and disability. We talked about lack of education, causing a lack of organization and advocacy. In other words, you might have impairments, but you become more disabled by being poor. Your parents might focus on getting food and have no time for your special needs. So your parents might, may carry you to school, but when you grow up, this becomes impossible. So with no services, with no wheelchair, you don't get any education. You may not get the resources to live independently and to organize and advocate. Then we talked a lot about attitudinal barriers that are especially heavy on the labor market within employment. And this is a problem that's huge in all regions of the world, from the most wealthy ones to the least. And then we talked about the need for knowledge sharing and success stories about how to get governments to ratify the CRPD for those who still hasn't done, haven't done so but not the least to more effectively implement the CRPD. We also talked about different ways to protest and different ways to advocate for change. And we need to be much better at sharing knowledge about effective means. And then we talked about the need for different DPOs to work together and for DPOs to make alliances with parent organizations and other civil society organizations. And such coordination and collaboration will also improve the cooperation with national human rights institutions. Because they tend to be stronger and more resourceful than individual DPOs. So for the DPOs to get genuine influence, uh, it's necessary to have those alliances. Thank you. Excellent. Do we have the rapporteur for group three uh, from yesterday? Was there a rapporteur from group three? Uh, if you have a mic, that's fine. <laughs> All right, good morning, everybody. My name is Jim Herbert. I'm a professor in rehabilitation and human services at the Pennsylvania State University in the U.S. Um, our group, good discussion. Uh, some of the key issues, one of the things we were talking about is how do you get groups to work together? And we talked a little bit about different um, consumer groups, but also that really kind of focused into how do you get groups to work together and collaboratively with politicians? And part of that, some of the key things that I heard was, you know, being sharing our stories. Um, that's something that I think that was evident yesterday and is important to politicians to hear what are the issues that are confronting us? And then also on the flip side is that um, politicians who 
support disability issues and, and the rights of people with disabilities, we also need to support them and their agenda and their political uh, efforts. So it's not sort of a kind of a one and done thing. So I think the big thing that we were talking about is establishing and maintaining relationships with politicians, which then extended into people in our communities, telling our stories to the people that we interact every day and letting them uh, aware of what are some of the things that, that we struggle with and the things that are important to us and the relevance of developing and, and promoting social relationships. Then the other thing towards the end, we kind of flipped it around a little bit, was um, what questions do we have as a result of yesterday? And some of the questions that were asked is, um, you know, when people are thinking about your next meal, how, do, how does disability, how, how important is that? And where, where does that lay in relation to the basic kinds of issues and needs that we have? Um, do people have the resources necessary to uh, have an obligation to help others? Um, how do you make things accessible? How do you make, uh, how, how do you increase awareness about uh, resources exist? And, um, and I think one of the mantras that I heard was, the fight goes on. So that was about the gist of our, so apologies to anyone that said something really inspiring that I missed. And uh, so, all right, thanks. Thank you. Do we have a rapporteur for group number four? Morning. My name is Kangezile Lamini. I'm the director of the Federation of Organizations <coughs> of people with disabilities in Swaziland. What was discussed in our group boiled down to about five points. The first one we discussed around the importance of self-advocacy. And then we gravitated to another point which was basically a discussion on who represents people with disabilities or NGOs in UNCRPD accountability stroke monitoring. And then we went on to discuss about how we can improve a collaboration between different organizations. And this was in the light of avoiding project-based approach to what we are doing. Uh, the other discussion was around how to manage regional, national, international groups for better efficiency. And what was discussed uh, towards the end was the interpretation of UNCRPD. But before the discussion began, we delved a little bit on the organization of how we see uh, uh, this training should have been organized. But I won't go into that because I'm sure we will be given some time to discuss that bit. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, rapporteurs. Uh, it seems that we came out of yesterday with some key questions um, and also some suggestions for the speakers and the organization of today that we try to answer questions one by one and that the person answering the question first repeat the question so that everyone understands uh, what question is being answered. So we'll try to do that. Um, we also had a key question on interpretation of the CRPD and especially how to use general comments, um, in particular general comment on Article 12. Um, and I think some other questions, many of the other questions were about 
how civil society is actually using the convention on the ground and how to ensure that there is alliance building, collaborative action, um, inclusion in monitoring um, of civil society and of people with disabilities themselves in uh, those processes. So I think we will get into that today with all of our sessions. And I would like to then start our sessions with the, um, as I said earlier, we've switched the order. So we'll start with the session on the national human rights institutions, amplifying the voice of civil society through national human rights institutions. As we talked about yesterday, with 165 ratifying countries and a mandate on government to ensure participation of persons with disabilities and their representative organizations, disabled persons organizations in implementation and monitoring of the convention, the CRPD provides a political opening for people with disabilities to make demands on government. As Gerard has said in the past, and I use this quote all the time, Gerard, <laughs> now that there is a high level legal instrument at the international level on disability, the main challenge ahead is to harness it effectively. First, this assumes an organized and vocal civil society, one that can successfully articulate arguments for change based on the norms of the convention. I think that's a very important um, concept that Gerard has talked about, is that there is a opening now for the voice of civil society, but how do we ensure that civil society uses that? Making those successful demands on government requires that organizations of people with disabilities are resourced in order to play this role. And by resourced, I mean not only funded, but capacitated, knowledgeable, networked with key partners, um, et cetera. And one of those key partners is, um, or are, national human rights institutions. In our work at the Disability Rights Fund and the Disability Rights Advocacy Fund, one of the areas that we fund DPOs, disabled persons organizations, to do advocacy in is to to uh, advocate to national human rights institutions for a role, um, uh, around their role in monitoring the rights of persons with disabilities. And we have had some successes in that area. So in Indonesia, for example, um, disabled persons organizations advocated that the National Human Rights Action Plan be inclusive of disability rights as outlined in the convention. And that has happened now. So there's not a separate disability rights monitoring agenda from the Indonesian Human Rights Commission. It is combined with all human rights and that is a real success. Um, in Malawi, our grantees successfully or, um, organized around and advocated to the uh, Malawi Human Rights Commission to establish a disability rights monitoring unit within the commission, and that is now established. So that is also a success. Uh, however, often what we see is that the National Human Rights Commission um, has only one person responsible for all vulnerable groups. So for monitoring the rights of women, for monitoring the rights of orphans, for monitoring the rights of of elders for monitoring the rights of people with disabilities, and this is a, a, a big barrier. In addition, another thing that we see is that the National Human Rights Commissions do not have enough resources to play their monitoring role. For example, in Uganda, um, the National Human Rights Commission of Uganda, their annual budget is less than the annual budget of the National Umbrella Organization of Persons with Disabilities. So how can they play a monitoring role when they have no money? So with that, um, I would like to pass over to our presenters of the day, and we'll start with the most popular presenter from yesterday, <laughs> Elizabeth Kamundia. Elizabeth. 
Um, good morning, everybody. And thank you, thank you, Diana. Um, so today I'd like to talk about, I'd like us to, to talk about how um, civil society in Kenya have used the National Human Rights Institution to amplify um, their voice. And so before I begin, I'd like to acknowledge that I received input in preparing this presentation from my colleagues in civil society, um, Michael and Miriam of Users and Survivors of Psychiatry in, in Kenya, and from a colleague from the National Commission on Human Rights, Mwakazi, and a colleague, Anderson, from the United Disabled Persons of Kenya. So just to, to, to acknowledge that, I, I think, is important from the beginning. So yesterday, we discussed um, a lot with a focus on challenges. So challenges that um, civil society in developing countries face. So today, I'm happy to have the opportunity to at least talk about some more positive um, work that is coming out of civil society in developing countries with a specific focus on Kenya. So opportunities, um, a brief look at challenges and looking at lessons learned in how this relationship between civil society and NHRIs can be used to sort of really take forward the rights of people with disabilities. Um, so in terms of opportunities, so in terms of how DPOs in Kenya are using um, or working together with the National Commission on Human Rights to amplify their voice, I think the most important one, I'd say, is monitoring. So, um, so just to give some background to this, Kenya passed a new constitution in 2010. And as a result of that, there was a lot of groups coming together prior to the passing of the constitution to discuss what rights that they wanted to see reflected in the constitution. So this formed um, a great opportunity for DPOs to come together so that they could sort of um, be able to have at least something on disability in the constitution. And as a result, we have a standalone article in the constitution on, uh, on the rights of people with disabilities, article 54, and we have sign language as part of, as one of the national languages of the country, officially in the constitution. So just to highlight that this, that, pre that gave an opportunity to form, to make kind of a strong DPO movement in the country. So Kenya National Commission on Human Rights was appointed the monitoring body in 2011 under Article 33.3. And I was working at the Kenya National Commission on Human Rights then. So in this presentation, I'm also drawing from that experience as well as having worked with the commission subsequently from the side of civil society. So the first um, aspect of, 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 of the first thing that we did after receiving the monitoring role was to call together a meeting um, with DPOs to present to them what our ideas were about monitoring and to receive feedback. So we had that engagement where we presented the monitoring tools and we really heard a lot from the DPOs what we were missing, what was important to include, and to kind of ask who from the DPOs would come with the staff of the Commission on Monitoring Visits. So in, in preparing for this presentation then, I had um, the opportunity to ask the person from the DPO who has accompanied the Commission on Monitoring Visits what that meant. And I'd like to just highlight some of the things that, that, that the person said just so we, we really get a sense of why this is important. So the question that I posed was, having accompanied KNCHR on one of its monitoring trips, what was your experience and what was the added value of having you as a person from civil society there? And um, the response I got was that the, it's great to be involved from the get-go, so that the commission provided us with the monitoring tools in order to provide feedback and comments from the beginning and that the DPO representative was chosen through the umbrella body, so it felt really representative, um, and that the experience allowed the individual to work with the commission and to form that linkage with the commission, and that 
As a result, it enabled the DPO to establish a network and, an, and a linkage with the Commission, which then meant that in subsequent events of the Commission, the DPO would be involved where it might never like it, it might never have been involved. So for example, as a result of working together in monitoring, when the Commission on Human Rights was doing a public inquiry on reproductive health, they focused very much on the voice of people with disabilities. And that came from having formed that relationship in the first place. So just to, to highlight um, how important that was, and that being part of the NHRI's um, activities enabled the DPO to form linkages at the grassroots level so that DPOs at the national level also meet with DPOs at in, in rural Kenya and kind of form that, that kind of bond. So the, the, the value of having uh, civil society as part of monitoring is really manifold. There's many, many reasons why that is an important thing to have. So moving on then to um, the other way in which DPOs use the commission to amplify their voice is with regard to law and policy reform. And on law and policy reform, um, I'd like to begin with a, a bit you know, of a footnote to say that um, to, to just remark on one of the main differences I find at least between um, the role of the law in developed countries and, and developing countries. Um, and I think what I'd like to highlight is that yes, I acknowledge that law reform is an important part of advancing the rights of people with disabilities. And at the same time, to, to highlight that often people with disabilities are denied their rights through social and cultural mores that are quite extra legal. And so if you focus only on law reform in, in, in a place like Kenya, you can have the law, but have a, a strong um, people, you know, have a, a situation in which people tend to operate very much outside the law anyway. And so just getting the law there is an important first step, but is really not like a guarantee that that what is in the law will be will be done and i think that's an important thing to 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 put out there even as i talk about how dpos have worked with nhris towards law reform and this was mostly um on on the law and legal capacity so the kenya national commission on human rights um together with civil society organizations, worked on a briefing paper on the right to legal capacity, identifying the laws that violate the right to legal capacity, and identifying how people are denied the right to legal capacity outside the law in kind of more informal spaces, and making recommendations to the Law Reform Commission on what then needed to be done. Um, another, and, and this then led to the example that I'd like to give on capacity building and awareness raising. Um, so as part of di disseminating the, fi the findings of the briefing paper on legal capacity, the commission called together judges and other policymakers at high level to tell, you know, to to have a brief a debriefing about what the results of the research were. And as part of that, um, people with disabilities came to the forum and gave personal experiences, personal accounts. And after that, one of our first decisions to mention legal capacity was, um, was issued by a judge who was in that forum. Now, I think that was, um, it, it was a case. Um, it was a case that was based on the presumption that people, in, in the presumption that is embedded in our Sexual Offences Act, that people with intellectual disabilities cannot give consent for sexual relationships. And what the judge said was that it is improper and inconsistent with the Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities, and it's an affront to the dignity, to their right to dignity, to label a person as mentally retarded and proceed on that basis to assume that the person is incapable of making a free choice to engage in sexual intercourse. And the judge made a really strong sort of and, and the judge had attended the, 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 brief, the debriefing with, with the commission and with civil society. So we felt that that was, you know, there are other issues with the decision, but at, at the very least, we, we were at least happy with 
with having reached that. Um, there are also other opportunities that arise under international law, the key one being following up on concluding observations. So civil society and the NHRI in Kenya, our concluding observations came out in, in 2015. And there's a technical committee now that has been formed between the ministry that is responsible for disability, the Commission on Human Rights, and DPOs, civil society, to follow up on the concluding observations. So this is like one of the key key ways in which DPOs are working with the NHRI. And um, finally, the um, civil society is utilizing the NHRI's complaint mechanism. And I'd like to give an example on this that I thought was quite powerful. So Kenyan law allows, Kenyan law provides that a person with a disability who earns less than 150,000 Kenya shillings, which is about $1,500, should be exempt from tax. What was happening is that when people with psychosocial disabilities would apply to be exempted by the Kenya Revenue Authority, the authority would say, actually, you have an illness, not a disability, so you're not eligible to, to this tax for this tax exemption. So civil society then wrote a letter, users and survivors of psychiatry wrote to the commission and said, intervene. I mean, this is a violation of, of our rights and you know, it's discriminatory and all that. And the commission wrote to the Revenue Authority and to the National Council for Persons with Disabilities. And now people with psychosocial disabilities are eligible for tax exemption, which is, I think, a, like a big success just in terms of that using that relationship to yield real benefits. So um, um, in terms of challenges, just I'll, I'll highlight just one specific one because we looked at challenges a lot yesterday. But the main one at the moment is a clash of mandates um, between the Commission on Human Rights and the National Gender and Equality Commission with regard to the role of monitoring. So what happened is that in two, so the, new, the Constitution of Kenya establishes two bodies that are of equal power, actually three bodies, um, the Kenya National Commission on Human Rights, the National Gender and Equality Commission, and an Ombudsman Commission. In the beginning, the Commission on Human Rights is the one that was responsible for monitoring the rights of people with disabilities. Subsequently, that role has been taken from the Commission on Human Rights and given to the National Gender and Equality Commission, which is not accredited with the ICC and which does not have the status of, like the A status that the Kenya National Commission on Human Rights does. Um, this is because there's an act of pal the act of parliament establishing the commission on human rights gave it ro a role on in, in in rights except those that relate to special interest groups and the national gender and equality commission was it's a really strange situation was given roles to require um, you know to ensure compliance with treaties that have to do with equality and freedom from discrimination relating to in special interest groups including minorities persons with disabilities women and children so then what that has meant um, in fact, this is one of the things that the committee, these are some of the expressions of concern from the Committee on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities to Kenya. The committee expressed concern about the lack of clarity in the designation of a focal point or focal points for the implementation of the convention. The committee expressed concern that the Kenya National Commission on Human Rights does not now form part of the national mechanisms for monitoring the convention expressed concern that the current mechanism, the national gender inequality one, does not comply with the Paris principles, and expressed concern at the absence of specific mechanisms for the participation of civil society in the entire process of monitoring. So that's one of the challenges that we are facing, that change. Um, and you know, we looked at how ensuring diversity and participation is, is a challenge, and also limited resources, so I won't really go a depth into that, I'd just like to move on to the lessons that, that we have learned um, just in this process. So I think the key one is actually the one that I, um, um, okay, so the key, so there are a number of things that we have learned and I, I'll begin with the fact that oh, on clarity um, on Article 33 to institutions and their mandate and how important it is to have that and particularly how important it would be for the commission that has ICC accreditation to form part of the monitoring framework. 
So we've learned that um, since the commission, since the role of monitoring was taken from the commission, the commission has um, kind of taken its foot off the disability rights pedal, which isn't really what you would ideally like to see. Um, the, there's also need for to ensure diversity of representation in the DPOs involved in monitoring. Once again, that's something that has emerged as being quite important. It's important to build the capacity of DPOs, especially rural-based ones. One of the things my colleague from KNCHR said on this was that, look, we do tend to go back to the same DPOs over and over again because these not really so much capacity in other ones, particularly those ones in, in rural areas in terms of a rights-based approach. So just that remains a real gap and something that we need to do something about. We need to update the monitoring tools as, as the human rights kind of knowledge increases. So when we first developed the monitoring tools, for example, we hadn't really captured the right to legal capacity in the way that it is now that we have a general comment. And, I, and the tools haven't been updated to catch up with um, kind of how jurisprudence is changing on the rights of people with disabilities so quickly. And that it's important to collaborate with other marginalized groups as well. Thank you. Thank you, Elizabeth. I think because we are a little bit early and we have um, time, what I'd like to do, and based on the, um, the recommendations from one of the speakers this morning, the rapporteurs, is to take a few questions for Elizabeth before we pass to Valentin. Okay, we have a question down here. Thank you for excellent presentation. I'm Zayed Abdullah from Pakistan. Um, I was um, 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 uh, surprised to know that uh, there is tax exemption in Kenya for a certain uh, brackets uh, uh, for really uh, for disabled people. So uh, I wanted to ask whether this kind of practice is uh, uh, the, this tax exemption is given in other countries as well. Thank you. Um. I'm sorry, would you please repeat your question? I didn't really so, get you, sorry. Okay, uh, I, my question is pertains to uh, the tax exemption that is given to uh, persons with disabilities that fall in certain uh -huh. bracket mm -hmm. of income they earn. So my question is that it, it, is this practice carried out in other countries as well, the tax uh -huh. exemption for disabled people? Okay. Um, Okay, so the tax exemption, yes, it's, it's granted in Kenya. I don't know, does anyone here come from a country that grants tax um, exemptions to persons with disabilities? You can shout out the country aloud. Georgia? Georgia? India? India? India. Colombia? Colombia? Okay, so clearly there's lots, of, there's lots of countries where that happens as well. Thank you. Wheelchairs or stuff like that, you know, that, that would be tax exempt, but not everything. Okay, okay, thank you. Are there other questions for Elizabeth? Thank you, my name is Mohanad uh, from Jordan. Um, m m with regard to the tax exemption, uh, we have it in Jordan, but usually uh, I think it's very, uh, it has two edges because it's very risky in terms of what kind of philosophy uh, or ideology. I mean, these ta tax exemptions provisions are uh, being built on mm -hmm. because if people with disabilities, and unfortunately this is the case in Jordan and in other countries as well, they perceive it as a privilege, as one of the fundamental rights, which means that they don't really think what's behind these exemptions, 
which is kind of bridging the gap of lacking of accessibility, for example, in, 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 in transportation. So basically, or in, in, in its original shape, it should be kind of temporary provision, but unfortunately it's being misused by the uh, governments because for the governments, sometimes paying or giving tax exemption for them, it's much better than, for example, making a big renovation and accessibility throughout the country. So what we are trying to do now in Jordan and in some Arab countries, just to highlight that we shouldn't, as persons with disabilities, necessarily always advocate for tax exemptions, but we need to advocate for the causes and the reasons behind these tax exemptions and tell the government, look, I mean, if you are going to make the country fully accessible, there is no need anymore for any tax exemptions. Thank you. Thank you. Um, let's try to stick to questions. I know that we all have a lot of experience, but we will have some time later in the day as well for breakout sessions and for interactive discussion in this room. So if there are questions for Elizabeth. My name is Sagata. I come from India. Um, my question is how, uh, how effective is interaction between NHRIs and courts? As you just cited an example that, uh, uh, that uh, based on a ruling, uh, the NHRI, I mean, the findings of the NHRI was utilized by courts. So how effective is this mechanism? That's it. Um, okay, so thank you for that. I mean, the... Um, for that question, um, yeah, I I would like to, yeah, yeah. Okay, so oh, so yeah, I'm reminded to repeat the question. So the question was, as I understood it, how active is the interaction between NHRIs in Kenya and the courts? So I mean, I think one of the ways in one of the ways in which the NHRI in Kenya and courts interact is um, that the NHRI often is amicus in, in human rights cases that, that, that go before our courts. So that, that often happens and that the, um, there's a relationship where um, the judiciary will often send judicial offic officers to trainings or to um, when, when the NHRI is, for example, um, launching a report on, on, on one issue or another. So these, those are the two kind of things that, that immediately, immediately come to mind. Yeah. Great. Um, one or two more questions. Uh, this is Som from Nepal. I have a small query. It's like, you know, the, why the Human Rights Commissions, you know, uh, they, they are shifting to the Gender and Equality Commissions on, you know, the monitoring role of the commission because of the in, in our experience also nepal also we have you know now recently passed the constitutions and uh, uh, arranged different commissions like you know uh, commission on women and commission on means the number of commission is going to be set up according to the new constitutions but national human rights commission, commission is very important body to uh, see the you know on human rights issues Particularly, they are also uh, able to, you know, communicate with the Office of High Commissioner of Human Rights. So, if they are going to shift the responsibility on monitoring to other commissions, how this commission is going to be co coordinated with the international uh, commissions, means the Office of High Commissioners, or I don't know how it works. Okay. So, um, so if if I understood your question is why are we having many commissions uh, being set up to do more or less the same role under the under many of the new constitutions and how will it actually work out in practice? Is that, okay. So the experience from Kenya was. Um, um, so we used to have just one commission, the Kenya National Commission on Human Rights, but when we immediately the constitution passed, I think the yeah I think what what happened is that there was a big lobbying voice from women 
and women rights organizations saying that women's issues were lost in the one human rights commission and saying that you know so advocating that um, when you have one commission that is looking at political like pol civil and political rights and you know other sort of issues issues of women and issues of other special interests, like special and marginal, marginalized groups, I mean, are, are tend to be lost within that commission. So the, it was, I'd say it was kind of a political, it was also kind of a political settlement to have a national gender and equality commission and the, the equality commission as a, as a separate thing, at least in the context of Kenya, that's how it, it worked out um, as a result of really strong lobbying and yeah, from, from the women's rights organizations. Okay, let's take one more question down here and then we will move on in our presentation. Thank you, I'm Frederick Kim Sigela from Tanzania. Uh, two questions from you, Elizabeth. Um, you talked about the involvement of civil society in the HRIs. I don't know whether the DPO were invo are involved in the monitoring process of the uh, of human rights, you know, violation in the country. Uh, the second uh, question: um, You have a new constitution. Um, how do you compare with the previous one? Is the new one is more progressive in in terms of disability issues and? Um, uh, if so, what were the strategies that you put forward to make sure that disability issues are coming up clearly in the new constitution? Because in Tanzania as well, we are in the process of reviewing the constitution. Mm -hmm. We haven't completed the process yet. Probably you could learn something from you guys. Thanks. Okay. Okay, so two questions. Um, whether DPOs are involved in monitoring of human rights violations within the country other than specifically under the disability treaty, right? Yeah, um, and whether and how, um, how we managed to get a provision, whether the, the new constitution is better than the old one in protecting the rights of people with disabilities and strategies that were used to, okay, um, to get to, to, to get there. So in terms of DPOs being involved in monitoring human rights violations in the country, I'd say this happens perhaps through the universal periodic review process, the UPR process. That's where I've seen the commission working together with DPOs and civil society. Um, so for a, to give an example, this week, the, the Commission on Human Rights is holding meetings on why Kenya should ratify optional protocols to the conventions that it hasn't ratified yet as part of the requirements under the UPR process. And I know that a number of civil society organizations have, DPOs specifically, have been invited to this. And the invitation letter was actually clear that it wasn't just to give input on the optional protocol to the CRPD, but also a disability voice to the Convention Against Torture, you know, why, the, the, why it's important to ratify sort of other things from a disability perspective. So they've, um, th so maybe not human rights monitoring of violations in, you know, throughout the country, but there are ways in which uh, civil society is engaging with the commission beyond just the CRPD. Um, in terms of the new constitution, yes, our new constitution is much better than the, the one that we had before, just in terms of how forward it takes us with regard to the rule of law and with regard to recognizing human rights of all people and especially for people who've historically been marginalized in the country. Um, I'd say the we had a long process. So by the time we had a long and quite protracted constitutional review process, by the time we were getting to the, com the committee of experts that eventually delivered this constitution, groups had learned the importance of really articulating your issues. Like groups had learned the importance of coming together and kind of getting a common voice and saying, what is it that you want? So you will find specific rights for people who are elderly, specific rights for people, for children, for 
quite well articulated like that. And I think the disability movement took part in that. But what I'd like to highlight actually more, even more importantly is that after the constitution passed, the umbrella body and formed um, an organization called the Disability Caucus for the implementation of the constitution. And the role of this was now to follow up to make sure you don't lose the gains. So as law reform processes pursuant to the new constitution began, how well was disability being taken into account in these new laws that were being developed? And I think that is as equally important as participating to get something there in the first place. Excellent. Thank you, Elizabeth, and thanks all for your questions. I'd like to invite Valentin Aicelli, the Director of Disability in the German Institute on Human Rights, to present next. Well, good morning from my side. I'm very happy to see you all here. And I'm very happy to be here, being invited. Thanks. Um, it's an honor to, to be invited to contribute to this um, wonderful, exciting, and interesting program. Um, my uh, presentation is on the example of Germany, on the German Institute for Human Rights as a national human rights institution in what way they cooperate with um, civil society organizations in the field of disability. And uh, the heading, as the heading of this session of this panel is, um, is saying amplifying voices of civil society, I, uh, for the start, I would like to make a question mark. I'd like to put a question mark and, uh, you know, that, that's maybe the issue we want to discuss and maybe that's what we want to explore now with uh, the brief presentation I'm giving, whether the role of the German Institute for Human Rights is the one in amplifying voices of civil society, or put differently, what to expect from a national human rights institution from the perspective of civil society and what can be the outcome of some sort of um, cooperation, and I think in, in that sense it adds up very nicely with uh, the presentation we had from Elizabeth on the, on the uh, Kenyan uh, experience. My presentation has three parts. I just want to brief out uh, some information in terms of background information. Then I want to give you three examples and fields of our work in which we have developed uh, some sort of cooperation with civil society organizations. And uh, I have a brief section with some sort of concluding remarks and um, the ideas that uh, we could discuss um, later. Background information. The German Institute for Human Rights, as being that, is the national human rights institution. It's um, an institution based on the Paris Principles. They were mentioned by Karen McKenzie yesterday. That's the common standard of national human rights institutions. They are accredited along that standard. And if you look around the world, you find a quite variety, an institutional variety of national human rights institutions. Even they have the same standard, you know, their appearance, their work, their capacities, their functions, uh, they differ quite a bit. And if you want to form a typology, you have commissions, and we had this example from Kenya, you find ombudsmen, like in Spain or in Latin American world, committees, an institute, and the German Institute for Human Rights is in that format a national human rights institution. It had been founded in 2001, so it's a quite young organization, and the national human rights institutions globally, they form an alliance, which uh, is called the Global Alliance on National Human Rights Institution. And the German Institute for Human Rights has the honor to chair the Global Alliance uh, starting this year. When we look at the relationship of the CRPD and the German Institute for Human Rights. Um, 
we, uh, we find ourselves in a institutional network in relation to Article 33. The article has been mentioned a few times already yesterday. Um, it's that according to Article 33.1, it's about focal points in the government. Uh, we have that in the federal and in the land or regional governments. Article 33.3 is about the monitoring of civil society. And the significant article for this uh, session is the Article uh, 33.2. And I know that Gerard is going to say a few words, words about this. I just want to let you know how uh, the German uh, uh, situation is and what sort of solution has been found in German to implement Article 33.2. Since it's talking of a framework, an independent framework, and um, as um, uh, in the introduction was said, states have found very different solutions to that. In some states you find a frame, framework com being uh, composed of a number of actors, while in others you have a national human rights institution which is designated to be, uh, to be uh, the monitoring body, while in others you, uh, you wouldn't find a uh, an independent mechanism at all, even there is a national human rights institution. And in Germany you have the situation that the national human rights institution has been designated to be the independent framework to monitor the implementation of the convention. And we are probably one of the lucky ones that in addition to the mandate that was extended to the German Institute for Human Rights, we got a, a uh, also resources. We have, um, we have a core staff in my department, the independent mechanism of, of four persons, and uh, we added up the staff by you know, additional funding, and now these days we are seven people uh, working on that issues. So we have a special unit within the uh, entire organization. Um, and that sort of solution has been promoted by civil society organizations in Germany. They have been asked by the government, would you support that uh, the German Institute for Human Rights would take over that role of implementing and monitoring the convention? And they said yes. And the reason they have given is that um, they uh, find it very important that um, disability rights as human rights find themselves in a context of a human rights organization that is responsible for uh, human rights in general and there is a, a, some sort of interaction. We have a number of principles of the German Institute for Human Rights in order to remain our independence uh, and act and perform independently in direction to human rights issues. We find ourselves uh, as an organization with an own voice. We are open uh, in terms of cooperation with all agents, although we uh, do not um, have a long-standing formal cooperation with any. Uh, we keep equal distance to all agents, like this is governmental agents, civil society actors. Uh, we really, in a way, underline that we find ourselves as a unique actor with an own role and uh, having an own voice. At the same time, we, uh, of course, uh, find human rights principles important to um, to be reflected in our cooperation uh, with all actors. We want to be inclusive, equally accessible, transparent, accountable, and um, these things. Second part of my presentation is the modes of cooperation, three examples. The main example I want to give is the format that we have developed to consult with civil society organizations in the field of disability. 
and it has, in fact, uh, developed um, after the um, General Assembly had adopted CRPD in December 2006. And Prior to that meeting, actually, we hold meetings with civil society organizations because it was clear that we're going, um, we're coming uh, to uh, the issue whether Germany would ratify the convention and under which circumstances maybe they are considered reservations and how to prevent these sort of things, what sort of action needed to be taken for, Im for the implementation of the convention. So this format of consultation that we developed ever since the monitoring body was established in 2009 had some sort of history. And that was um, quite important because civil society organizations, of course, they knew everything about disability issues, political issues, um, but not so many of them had been familiar with the human rights perspective. And the German Institute for Human Rights, of course, was familiar with human rights perspective, but in terms of disability issues, it was a learning, and it's still a learning uh, organization. So bringing these expertise together was um, very important, and it's been ever since a mutual learning experience. And uh, the format um, formally was established when the monitoring body was there in 2009. And I brought a picture, uh, which I want to briefly describe, you know, which shows a situation in, in this sort of consultations that we're um, undertaking. You see um, a normal conference room, you have lights, uh, windows on the right hand side, and they're about um, 40 people in the room. Uh, at the end of the picture, you see uh, a set of table with um, people from the monitoring body. Uh, you see uh, on the right hand side, sign interpreters, and uh, and uh, you see also uh, the back of a head from a, 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 a table saying Anade. And I don't know whether uh, there is anyone in the room knowing Sigrid Anade. No, because she was taking part in the negotiation and is part of the independent living movement. So she's uh, um, one of those uh, taking part in this consultation on a regular basis. And what is the conceptual idea of the consultations? There are a number of elements I want to point out. We uh, meet three times a year, so on a very regular basis since 2009. And the consultations, they last about four hours. They are private, so it's not an open uh, event that everyone can come to. It's, um, you need to register beforehand. It's inclusive. It's us hosting the meeting, so we provide an accessible, inclusive environment to everyone. And it's semi-formal. Uh, we have an agenda but it's not a very strict and tight agenda. It's open for reactions or for suggestions uh, from, uh, from those uh, taking part in the meeting. Um, we have a number of members, so 60 organizations are on our list, and they represent a, quite a good spectrum of perspectives of persons with disabilities. Um, and uh, we have a, um, an average presence of 30 organizations that come to each meeting in, in a slightly, uh, sl slightly different way of um, uh, composition. Um, we had uh, 22 meetings since 2009, as I said. The functions we see, uh, looking back, uh, we want to provide a unique platform for the exchange of experiences and information, uh, to develop a common understanding on issues, problems, concepts, on, you know, on this, how we anal analyze the situation, what to do about it. Discuss CRPD-related issues in terms of 
how to interpret it, uh, and uh, also think of strategies that can be used by each and every organization if it like to. We never come to a common strategy that is used by everyone or we never come to a common statement, you know, for instance, a joint uh, state rele uh, uh, um, press release or something. But, you know, we are working towards a common understanding and uh, go about these things. Extracts from the agenda. For instance, uh, we have introduced UN documents. We had longer discussions on the translations of general comments on general comment uh, number one and two in terms of contents. We had a discussion on draft laws, for instance, the disability uh, equality uh, law uh, for the federal level. We, we have been uh, discussing draft policies, like the governmental policy on data collection and the reporting of the government in terms of um, this is Article 3331. Uh, of course, we had a number of discussions on concluding observations that were adopted for Germany last year. Um, in particular, for instance, the torture critique that the committee um, mentioned uh, in the uh, observations. And we have a number of single issues. Considering that there are a huge amount of issues, of course, we only can, you know, progress um, slowly, but you know, each time, each and every time, we can take up a number of issues that we discussed. And we have been using uh, this uh, in order to prepare publications that we work on, our statements uh, that we deliver, um, and uh, different submissions. Second example, very quickly, uh, we have been uh, in close relationship in the, in, in the phase where uh, Germany was on the review of the CRPD committee. And uh, we uh, did, uh, our role was uh, first of all to provide accessible information on our website how civil society uh, can do, um, submit parallel reports, prepare parallel reports. Uh, which was in 2010 already. Then we, in 2011, we had an event for all civil society organizations being interested in being informed about what a parallel report is or a shadow report. And we hosted this meeting also with the idea that uh, organizations might want to come together and do a joint report. That worked out because we had an alliance, a so-called CRPD alliance, um, that came together, it's, a, it's an alliance of, of sev uh, 78 organizations that uh, submitted one report to the committee. It's a very impressive work. They worked uh, 2012 to 2013, and in these meetings we had an observer status, so we could take part in these meetings. And in the phase of the review procedure with a list of issues and um, the, 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 the constructive dialogue, of course, we had, uh, we had uh, um, informal cooperation with uh, all NGOs representatives in Geneva. So that's been maybe another aspect of uh, cooperation with civil society and um, my last example, special efforts for highly marginalized groups. We believe uh, that national human rights institutions have a specific responsibility for those who don't have a voice or those, those voices are not heard because, for instance, they are not organized as a self-advocacy organization or they don't have representative organizations. And uh, it's part of our work to uh, find these groups and find ways how to get uh, their uh, rights be considered by politics and uh, relevant actors. And we had one example that was one of the, in Germany, forgotten groups, that's the death blind. And up to now, nobody knows how many people with, uh, in that situation live in the country. 
But uh, we had an NGO, NGO coming to us, uh, pre pressuring us to say, we, you need to do something about it. And what we did is we organized a special hearing in a very private uh, situation, a hearing of um, seven person, deaf blind person coming to us, telling their stories and telling what uh, uh, they think uh, uh, should, uh, should be different. And um, we, afterwards we had a press release, we followed this up in our lobby activities and uh, we st uh, still give this uh, issue special attention in different contexts. So it's been uh, important uh, also here to have this cooperation with civil society in terms of really uh, organizing that meeting and getting in touch with these people. And we are considering to uh, maybe work along that uh, with a new group which is refugees with disabilities. As you know, probably know, last year many refugees have come to Germany, uh, more than a million, and among these there are persons with disabilities. And we want, because there is no, no solid information available, we want to you know, explore by you know, different modes, for instance, the situation on it. So I'm closing with a summary. So uh, the question was whether we amplify the voice of civil society, and I said to some extent, yes, we do, but um, uh, we do it in a, in a filtered way. Uh, we uh, still think we have our own role to play, our own voice and our own agenda, but uh, true is that our agenda is highly influenced by civil society organizations to some extent, and uh, it, um, we rely on feedback, on the support, and, um, and I'm very happy that we, as uh, my department, is highly receptive to, uh, to this. So I thank you for your attention. And uh, if you want more information on the German Institute for Human Rights, you can find some information in English on our website. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Valentina. I think that was a very helpful, very practical presentation um, that I, I hope some of you can take away from to help civil society to advocate to your National Human Rights Commissions for a larger role. Um, I would like to open up the floor for a few questions for Valentin before we move to Gerard. Are there questions? <laughs> Thank you. So you described that you had observer status when you, when 78 organization made <coughs> their alternative or shadow report to the official country report? Is it not us? Okay, sorry. It's better. So, Thanks. Okay. So you described that you had observer status mm. when all these organizations made their alternative report. Would you consider actually facilitating such a process being part of the report writing, even write it on, <coughs> that you actually did the writing on behalf of a group of organizations? Okay, thanks for the question. The question was whether uh, we would promote to write a report for civil society as a national human rights institution. And uh, the answer is clearly no. Uh, civil society has to produce their own reports they can do a joint report, there can be many reports. Uh, our role is maybe to facilitate, make things easier, but we wouldn't write a report. Same with the government. They have to write their own report. There is a discussion whether national human rights institutions should contribute to a national report. Uh, we deny that. Uh, we, we clearly think in terms of clear role, division, you know, state actor, they have to report, they are accountable to the committee. 
uh, there is civil society, they have to contribute um, and uh, is valuable, and, but national human rights institutions are a unique actor on their own, and that's why uh, they write an own report. I brought a parallel report that we produced, um, and uh, you know, one example I missed. I want to take the chance now to deliver this, because what, some of the issues, of course, that we put in our parallel report, which was independent of the civil society reports and the state reports, of course, was dealing with the uh, issues of participation of civil society, yeah? And uh, to give a view on that and recommendations on that, of course. And in that sort of sense, we were uh, trying to promote. But you know, uh, in terms of processes, I I'd say you know, the product, the outcome, and the production of it must be, uh, in a way, in a in, uh, uh, clear division. Uh, uh, there was a question from Allison. She's already got the mic, so we'll go there, and then we'll come down here, <laughs> and then up there. Sorry, Allison Hillman from Open Society <coughs> Foundations. Just a quick clarifying question. I thought that I heard you say that the German uh, Institute on Human Rights was responsible for implementation and monitoring. Mm -hmm. And so, question, did I hear that correctly? And then second question, you were <laughs> discussing that you're involved in Discussing draft laws and policies, are you also involved in supporting the drafting of laws and policies, and how does that work? Okay, thanks for both questions. Question one was whether uh, I correctly said that the German Institute for Human Rights is in the role of implementing the convention. Thanks for that, because that's not correct. Yeah, we are in the role in monitoring, while state uh, uh, entities are uh, under the obligation to implement the convention. Uh, the second question was whether we are somehow uh, involved in policy drafting, correct? Uh, to some extent, our work is, uh, is di directed uh, to make it easy for governmental uh, entities or for parliament to take up certain phrases for law, for instance. Uh, so we propose certain formulations, how we think that could be the best way of, for instance, changing the federal law on elections or the educational laws in the lender or the laws for ps uh, of, uh, in terms of uh, mental health, etc. So uh, we promote uh, precisely some sort of formulations, but you know, it's uh, still up to them to, to decide whether they want to take it up or not. Uh, but uh, we, of course, give policy advice in many issues, so we are advising uh, uh, towards us uh, uh, policies. Mm -hmm. On. Hi, my name is Christy Lynch. I'm from Ireland. Um, in Germany, you have a very strong sheltered workshop movement. And at European level, they've been quite resistant to Article 27. On one of your slides, you mentioned workshops. And I'm just wondering if you were referring to sheltered workshops. And is that something the Institute has looked at? The question was whether um, we, the German Institute, had looked at sheltered workshops. Um, we uh, just recently looked at uh, in these issues, yes. Uh, um, we have about 300,000 persons that uh, work in sheltered workshops. And uh, last year the committee recommended to abolish, now that's the wording, to abolish uh, uh, the workshops that we have. And um, in, uh, uh, we had a follow-up conference on all the uh, concluding observations in June, uh, where the government representative uh, announced that uh, they are not willing to take up these recommendations. They will not only keep the sheltered workshops, but they want to make them stronger. So there are a number of policies directed to strengthen uh, workshops. And uh, we have um, now just um, uh, 
two weeks ago published a paper, a discussion paper, let's say, um, you know, that, um, that we think it's, um, it's crucial uh, to keep on discussing uh, how to implement the recommendation of the committee and, and we, the last uh, civil society consultation, uh, beginning of June, we used to discuss that issue with civil society organizations. And uh, I think we never had a session that uh, reflected such a controversial perspective from civil society organizations. You know, uh, that was really, really interesting. It's a huge controversy. Well, one of the, some of them really want to keep them, others really want to abolish them. And in, importantly to note is that, you know, the, uh, the persons working uh, in workshops, they are organized, they have their own representatives, and uh, they, uh, they are a strong voice in, in favoring in, to keep them and just, uh, you know, underline their importance for them. Okay, uh, we had a hand over here in the middle on the... Thank you. And then thank we'll go back. Thank you very much. I just had a follow-up question. Um, how has the consultation group discussed the matter? Is that the committee you're referring to? Um, and how does the, um, the German Institute interpret the UNCRPD to, uh, in light of sheltered workshops? It's just basically a follow-up question because the uh, CRPD doesn't say anything about child workshops, so I'm just wondering how, what the formal position is on, of, the, of, of, of the Institute. Um, well, oh, national human rights institutions are somehow in the role to interpret human rights treaties. So we are, to some extent, also asked to interpret CRPD, but of course we see CRPD in interaction with other human rights treaties and we see that the uh, CRPD committee sh is, is working in, in, a, in this sort of complex normative organizational uh, setting. But the committee and what the committee says, of course, is something that we promote in our country. Yeah, uh, there are some parts of which we are not fully convinced of, but nevertheless we we point out that the committee has that so, and uh, we try to support and argue, uh, you know, uh, uh, explain what the committee might have uh, thought of that. So, in terms of workshops, we have uh, rather focused on what the committee has recommended to Germany. Thank you. Um, we had a hand right there. Hi, thank you. Thank you so much for uh, the presentation. Um, quick question, to what extent uh, in the different participatory processes that you had, consultations and uh, et cetera, you uh, intentionally involved the young people with disabilities? Thank you. Thank you. Um, the question was whether we intentionally uh, involve persons, young persons with disabilities. Uh, so far we have not. But that's a good point. Okay, we had two hands here in the front and I think after these questions we're going to stop and turn to the Gerard as the next presenter. Hello, this is Judy from the United States. So my question about the sheltered workshops um, you have a quota system, and it's been my understanding that with the quota system, companies can place people in off-site from their companies. Um, are some of the people that are working in the sheltered workshops people that are benefiting from uh, salaries from corporations or other entities um, to be in compliance with the quota? understand my question? No. So my, my information may be incorrect, but you have a quota in Germany, right? And that quota, ob oh, okay. and that quota obligates, I don't mm. know what the percentage is, 3%, whatever. We've heard over time that um, companies can meet their quota. Mm. The person doesn't have to work within the company. And so I'm wondering if one of the 
reasons for the large numbers and for the workers wanting to stay in those workshops has to do something with the quota. I mean, the, the, the major challenge implementing Article 27 is to, um, to create an inclusive labor market. And Germany, yeah, and Germany has not really succeeded with that. And uh, even they have um, taken some efforts. So uh, the quota you mentioned is that if, if an enterprise of a certain size is not, uh, is not giving uh, labor to persons with dis disability to a certain percentage, they have uh, to pay penalties. And the penalty is collected and spent on promoting uh, education and labor for persons with dis disabilities. And it's... Huh? They find companies and then the money that they raise from finding the companies is then used to support the workshops, yeah? No. The money comes from somewhere else, if that's the question. But nevertheless, it's... Um, okay. okay. If that's the question, the answer is no. The money comes from public ma um, tax money. We had uh, another question here, and then we'll uh, stop with questions for now. Yeah, well, I'm Claudio Berger from Switzerland, uh, and the the question that I had was regarding also the sheltered workshops. Mm. So you have the position from the committee basically asking to abolish it, and you have the the position of the government basically wanting to keep them. So the role of the, how do you, uh, and then you have the, the discussion on the civil society which is split. So <laughs> what's your position as a NHRI mm. on, on, consul on consulting those different uh, viewpoints? Mm. Well, well, our main point is at the moment yeah. that a government cannot just simply wipe away the recommendation of the CRPD committee. It needs to be willing to discuss the issue. Thank you all, and thank you, Valentin. <laughs> we'll now pass the floor to Gerard to talk about the global level draft guidelines of the CRPD Committee on Engagement with NHRIs. Thanks a lot, Diane. I was saying earlier on, wow, I'd like to get a visa for Kenya. <laughs> um, such creative stuff happening there. Um, Hope you had a good party last night. You probably missed out oh, that uh, I played accordion for three tunes. That's okay if you missed that. Um, <laughs> I do remember uh, Oscar Wilde once saying that the definition of a gentleman is somebody who knows how, pl how to play accordion but chooses not to. Um, so by that yardstick, I'm definitely not a gentleman. Um, it really pains me to begin a presentation like this by recalling an insight from an academic at <gasps> Yale University. Um, and Reisman was writing in the 1950s and he looked to what he called the difference between the myth system of law and the operation system of law. And to put it quite bluntly, the CRPD is the myth system. It's the utopian vision are where we'd all like to get, although sometimes the actual end destination is very unclear. The operation system is what happens in Tbilisi, what happens in Dublin, what happens in Washington, and so on and so forth. And I often felt that the, I will get to the draft guidelines, believe me. Uh, I often felt that Reisman, Reisman's ghost was hanging over the drafting of the treaty. Because midway through, and, and Rosemary Chaos will remember this very vividly, States said to us, don't have the same old treaty monitoring system because it's failed. And yeah, it had largely failed. And the reason it had failed is because it's out there in the ether in international law, in Geneva or in New York. 
I much prefer New York myself to Geneva, but that's another day's story. And so there's no obvious one-to-one -one correspondence between the edicts of the myth system and the actual dynamics of change in Tbilisi or in Dublin or in Pretoria. And so they challenged us, why don't you come up with something that will actually make a difference? And I do remember, because I was with the delegation of national human rights institutions at the time, that we took that seriously and we said to states parties, okay, let's abandon traditional mon uh, monitoring at the international level. Let's have smart monitoring so that the UN committee or whatever it's gonna call, be called will fix on an issue that's morally urgent, like employment, that will gather evidence from the member states on that particular issue about where the obstacles were, where the challenges were, where the innovations were, and then subsequently bring all houses of the UN system together to try and craft solutions. We thought that was pretty smart. Uh, lo and behold, they, they did what diplomats always do, they compromised, and they continued with this international treaty monitoring system, which is what we're in part discussing, uh, but they also put in this Article 33. And Article 33 to me comes squarely from Reisman's thinking. How do we convert majestic generalities into practicable lines of change? And the core of Article 33 is what I call the triangulation of change at home where it matters most. Between government, but now smart government, that has focal points and coordination mechanisms, civil society who've never been at the table before, and that's the most morally urgent thing, and then a reality check built in, in the form of national human rights institutions. Now, they don't call them that in Article 33. You'll well remember, Rosemary. Uh, we said, well, why don't you logically therefore refer to the Paris principles in Article 33 and got immediate pushback almost unanimously from most states, and it was quite um, negative pushback. It was along the lines of, ha, you've made a breakthrough in terms of UN General Assembly resolution, but you'll get that converted into hard international law over our dead bodies. So that's why there's cryptic language in Article 33 about general principles, blah de blah de blah But it's pretty obvious it's pretty obvious that the drafters saw this triangulation between smart government, um, civil society, and independent monitoring mechanisms as the key to change. And I've always said, beware of the elegance of international law, beware of these general principles. It's where it matters most locally that it counts most. And that's the interesting innovation in this particular treaty. And the utility of national human rights institutions in that triangulation of change is they are the window. They are the transmission belt that bring the majestic generalities of international law home. They open the window, they refresh political breezes with the breeze of international law for what it's worth and add value to the process of change. It's not as if they dictate the process of change are the outcome of the process, but they add something that's been absent hitherto. And that's incredibly important. If you want to get really academic about it, there's a guy in New York University, NYU, um, who champions this idea that we should be increasingly looking at international human rights treaties, not as lawyers' charters, with which to say, aha, bad boy, you're falling short of X, Y, or Z but as an instrument to socialize states toward right behavior. So it really matters that we have this institutional mechanism in place to kind of own the norms, to internalize the norms, to tailor them to local circumstances in Japan or in Georgia and so forth, and then drive the process of change without waiting for a remote body like the UN committee to tell you what to do. Um, so, Interestingly enough, if you go back 15 years, uh, even 10 years, uh, the, the DPO community, the disability NGO community, were rather resistant to this idea that human rights commissions, national human rights institutions, had, as we say, skin in the game, that they were to be legitimate actors in the process of change. 
I think there was a pretty immature attitude that this treaty is our treaty, that other actors should not be engaged, and we own it and we drive it. Uh, actually, I've always said the UNCRPD is not primarily about disability. It's primarily a theory of justice that everyone should subscribe to and own, and therefore there are multiple actors who are always going to have to be involved in processes of change. That's come full circle. And one of the key takeaways from our American colleagues yesterday was collaboration. Crossing boundaries, engaging with others, working with and through others, and vice versa uh, to drive a process of change. That uh, it's almost impossible to do it on your own. You have to develop the skills to develop alliances and cross boundaries and so forth. I think it's also changed because 10, 15 years ago, a lot of human rights commissions in HRIs, there was good reason to suspect that they weren't as genuinely independent as they ought to have been. But I think that's been changing. Um, a, a wit once told me in Ireland that the tradition of governments is to give these institutions lots of money, but no powers, or lots of powers, but no money. Um, I think that's changing. And we see um, maybe 15 years ago, there was two or three human rights commissions really, really, really engaged in these issues. The Australian one, head and shoulders above the rest of the world. I don't know about now, <laughs> but 15 years ago, that was certainly the case. Now, flashback to the last session of the UNCRPD. You had seven state reports up for examination. Six NHRIs from six different countries put in their own shadow reports. That's a huge, remarkable change over time. So I think we're beginning to see uh, a more mature dynamic between civil society uh, and NGO, uh, human rights commissions and so forth. So, so a lot's changing. The, the ground is shifting. You may have noticed, uh, but only if you're a policy wonk like me, okay? You may have noticed a very landmark resolution from the UN General Assembly in December about opening up all of the processes of the United Nations to having the equal presence of national human rights institutions there. Um, that should have happened over 20 years ago when the Paris Principles were adopted. That was the logical thing to do. What's the point of giving people uh, valorization if you don't actually admit them into the process? Well, maybe then again we go back to Reisman, the MIT system and the operation system. It takes a long time for the two to close up. Um, and the UN CRPD committee uh, about two years ago decided to put together draft guidelines, suggested lines of action for how to optimize the interaction between the committee and civil society and national human rights institutions. Now, their original thinking was to do this together, civil society and national human rights institutions. One or two very influential members of the committee said, no, um, national human rights institutions now are no longer an appendage. They're really an important third, um, uh, what's the word I'm looking for, third leg on this stool of Article 33. Of government, smart government, civil society engaged and at the table, and by the way, not just pointing out where governments have gone wrong, most governments know where they've gone wrong, right? Bringing solutions to the table, telling them, have you thought about this? Croatia is doing something really interesting, have you thought about that? And then national human rights institutions, uh, not merely as a reality check and monitoring, but also promoting, and indeed many human rights commissions even promoted the ratification of the treaty, not just the actual implementation of the treaty itself, and protection. Um, people mightn't be aware, but national human rights institutions group regionally. And I was very proud to have been part of the European regional group's first amicus brief before the European Court of Human Rights 10, 12 years ago. Uh, and by the way, if I wrote it now, I'd wrote it, write it completely differently to the way we wrote it 10 or 12 years ago. Um, so do bear in mind that it's not just heft nationally, but it's heft regionally. And that's only beginning. Some of you from Africa can be really proud 
that the African Network of Human Rights Commissions has been the first to produce its own manual on how to actually engage with disability issues, which is a really good manual. Um, so the, the committee therefore did the right thing. They produced the draft, the, sorry, they adopted guidelines on the relationship between them and, Nash, and civil society. And that was right that that came first. And now they've produced draft guidelines on the interaction between the committee and national human rights institutions, which is a relationship that's flourishing at the moment. Witness six out of seven uh, parallel reports uh, recently submitted uh, to the committee in Geneva. Um, I won't go through in detail with the draft guidelines. They're excellent, very clearly drafted. They're obviously looking to optimize the mutual benefit of the relationship between national human rights institutions and the UNCRPD committee. If I were them, I would have put it slightly differently. I would have prioritized the relationship between national human rights institutions and their own domestic processes of change, whether it be in Berlin or in Tbilisi. You notice I keep mentioning Tbilisi. I love Tbilisi. <laughs> Um, but they didn't. What they did, and maybe this is just coming from where they're coming from, they talked about the relationship between national human rights institutions and themselves as a treaty monitoring body. By the way, the other special relationship that national human rights institutions are beginning to have is with other entities in the UN system. Um, and of course, I include in that the UN Special Rapporteur on the rights of people with disabilities. Alberto is up there, Catalina maybe, here she is, yeah. So it isn't just the committee, right? It's other very influential opinion leaders within the UN system that national human rights have to be engaged with and are in fact engaged with. Um, very, very uh, good stuff on all three tasks of national human rights institutions, monitoring, protecting, and promoting. Um, they, they also put in some draft language on reprisals. That's very important because certainly some of our human rights commissions in Asia Pacific have had reprisals against them even for speaking up on disability issues. So it was very symbolically important that that would be included in the actual draft guidelines. Um, maybe where I take a little bit of issue uh, because personally I just can't get my head into the reasoning of the UNCRPD committee, they talk about independent monitoring frameworks. Now anyone who's a close reader of the treaty will see that the treaty doesn't talk in those terms. It talks about a framework which may include one or more independent mechanisms. It doesn't demand that the framework itself be fully independent. I don't quite get what's going on there within the committee, and we've certainly made a contribution to them to perhaps refine that and reframe that. Um, another thing I don't get about the committee, and it's kind of reflected in the draft guidelines, is they do and they don't see a role for government or emanations of government in this framework for monitoring. For example, in some of the uh, concluding observations, they say it's okay if let's say the EEOC is part of the independent framework, provided their protections against conflict of interest. And yet out of hand, they ruled the presence of the European Commission in the framework as a per se violation of the treaty. Now maybe I'm getting a few things wrong, but I don't fully understand that. Just, uh, and I can't resist this, um, because it's a question I posed, and I still don't have an answer in my own mind. I'm willing it to be, I believe in the MIT system, but the operations system still eludes me. Um, the idea that the CRPD supersedes or is superior to other parallel sister conventions, whether at the international level in the UN system or regionally, which matters most to us here in terms of the European Convention of Human Rights, I don't get the arguments. You can't say that the disability treaty has come later in point of time, and because it's become later in point of time, it overrides, for example, the covenant on civil and political rights. That only holds true, and maybe I'll put John Wodach and Professor Dennis Driscoll on the line here, that only holds true if both treaties have exactly the same treaty signatories, 
who have exactly the same terms and conditions, namely reservations, understandings, declarations. That's not the case. The other argument for lex specialis is that the treaty that is more specialist in nature has precedence. But the presumption there is that you're taking a general concept and you're tailing it to a very specialized context. But if you've noticed what's happening in the jurisprudence of the committee, it's actually reverse engineering to change those grund norms, our basic understandings, for example, of legal capacity and so forth. Now, I'm willing it to be, but I haven't heard a good argument yet, and that's why I put the question to James Kingston yesterday over Ministry of Foreign Affairs. So, the deadline for commenting on the draft guidelines has technically passed, but it's my experience, they're always kind of informally willing to listen to you if you've got ideas. So, do go on to the website of the UNCRPD committee and have a look at those guidelines. And we're doing a study and we're going to be commenting on the guidelines, which will be launched in September, but maybe that will come out in the wash. Thank you very much. Thank you, Gerard. We have about 10 minutes for questions for Gerard, and then I would suggest that some of you at least might need a strong cup of coffee or tea before you come back for the next session. <laughs> Do we have any questions for Gerard? Mm. Maybe you already need a strong cup of coffee or tea. <laughs> Gerard said it all. Any question? Okay, two up there. Um, <clears throat> thank you for your presentation, Gerard. Uh, I just want to give you back your question in terms of how do you think we can deal in this in this in the situation between the CRPD and the other and the other treaties and and you are looking for an answer on how we can argue of, in terms of the CRPD supersede or not uh, the other treaties and I would like to hear more about your 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 <laughs> <laughs> your position on those on those terms. So, so the question has to do with um, the debate in my own mind, the agonization in my own mind, about how do you justify the treaty, uh, or rather the interpretation of the treaty, striking out in, in a direction that's starkly at odds with received understandings under the other treaties. That's a bloody hard question for a country like Ireland, for example. If you have one set of standards on liberty under the CRPD and a completely different set of standards under the European Convention of Human Rights, what are you going to do? You know, which are you going to prioritize? And it's just that the arguments that have been on the table so far for considering the CRPD's norms superior, I'm not, as a public international lawyer, I'm not convinced by them. I will them to be, <laughs> but I'm I'm putting it out there, please come up with other arguments, because so far they don't convince me. I don't know if Valentin wants to comment. Or John Wodach, where are you, John? <laughs> yeah, uh, thank you very much. The involvement of uh, civil society in uh, the monitoring uh, of this implementation process is really interesting, but the issue again comes to Elizabeth's discussion yesterday about the tokenism and uh, effective uh, participation and how are you going how do you deal with it that in the process uh, there is no effective participation you call them and then you talk to them and then you 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 draw your own analysis this is this is the process we have it how would that guideline probably see you from this angle and the other thing is the decentralization of of, of discussion with civil society because in some countries civil societies are confined and concentrating in the, the capital, the main city, and then uh, the human rights, international human rights institutions are attracted by such institutions and they don't go to, to the cities, the towns, villages, and then and regional cities. So h how do you go about it? Thank you very much. Great, so the question is about um, how do you avoid tokenism um, and also how do you extend the reach of the interaction beyond the 
obvious urban areas. Um, well, we're producing a manual that exactly gets into these issues. How do NHRIs re-engineer themselves to interact very, very closely with civil society? They haven't done it in the past with other groups. This is actually the first group in which they're required to do it under international law, um, as, as I see it. Um, so the art and the science is not there yet. Uh, but I think NHRIs are conscious that it's not there yet and are trying to intentionally work on that. Um, with respect to how do you ensure that NHRIs reach out, I mean, I th in federal systems you have emanations in, in the federal provinces um, and it's good practice to have uh, open hearings around the country. Our Human Rights Commission has done that quite a lot and in fact one of the things our commission has done is not just support individual litigation but launch their own full-scale inquiries. We had a big inquiry here in this country on violence within segregated educational institution and what it turned into really was a debate about economic and social rights and why these institutions still existed when they shouldn't have existed. Um, I'm sorry, I know I'm going off at a tangent here. Uh, I don't have direct answers yet, but I think that all of that is in the mix right now. And we need civil society to be engaging with NHRIs to get it right. Thank you, Gerard. Uh, I want to ask, and I mean, about uh, what you just mentioned. Uh, why, first of all, why do you think that, uh, b because I felt if I understood that um, you would like to have kind of legal argument to say that CRPD could supersede um, other instruments like ICCPR and others. But my question is, having the preamble in the CRPD with a cre clear reference to all uh, international human rights treaties and the two covenants, and having this, I mean, rule that the special text should have the, prefer the preference in case of any other uh, similar text or even contradictory text with other treaties. And the provision in Article 4 which says that any uh, more conducive provision in any other treaties or law shall be uh, implemented or applied for persons with disabilities. With all, with all these legal provisions, don't do you think that we have a clear, separate, different scopes for each treaty and we can look at them as complementary? And moreover, we can look at, for example, other treaties like the Covenants and the International Human Rights Bill as a reference to interpret, for example, some of the CRPD provisions because all of them, they are derived from, you know, I mean, the same values and principles. Thank you. Yeah, <laughs> um, so basically what's been posed is, is there not enough out there already, legally speaking, to convince people that the evolving norms in the UN CRPD take precedence over, for example, the covenant on civil and political rights and so, far, so forth? Um, I, I just remain to be convinced because the reference in the preamble means you can harmoniously interpret one set of conventions versus another or vice versa. It's a circular, it doesn't stop the circle, um, not to me at least. Um, secondly, the idea of a more specialist treaty coming along later in time makes sense when it shares general norms with the general treaty and applies them specially to a particular group. It doesn't make sense when you're going back upriver to actually transform core understandings of ideas in the other treaties. Um, I, I'd need to do a lot more research into Lex Specialis, but that's my understanding of it. So as a formulaic argument in favor of the priority of the CRPD, it just doesn't convince me. I see Rosemary Kaya swagging her head up. <laughs> Um, uh, Bruce Curtis from the United States. Uh, so I have actually two questions that reference each other. Um, 
first is under the human under the European Human Rights Treaty. How does it how does it recognize or deal with sheltered workshops and being supporting the human rights of people? And then the second is how does the Article Twenty Nine, in terms of its reference to 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 inclusion of employment, um, being a different viewpoint about you know enforcing the human rights of you know, of in of people in sheltered workshops. See the question point. Yeah, excellent. So we're getting back to the sheltered workshops issue. No, 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 it's really, really important. Um, and the question really about, in the European context, what does the European Convention on Human Rights have to say about these issues? I think I'd go right back to our colleagues in the United States, because the US Department of Justice very recently has issued um, crystal clear edict to the states to begin dismantling their sheltered workshop program out of a deep understanding of non-discrimination and equality, right? So I, I would go back to Charlotte, Charlotte's not here, and say it's not really relevant whether Article 29 or whatever it is explicitly bans sheltered workshops. The convention is explicitly grounded on a theory of equality and non-discrimination. That should be enough to reach the issue of sheltered workshops. However, the understanding of discrimination and equality and least restrictive environment and most inclusive environment, these are not terms that cross the Atlantic, right? If you look at the jurisprudence of the European Court of Human Rights, they do not have a deep theory of equality or non-discrimination. In fact, the equality provision was considered the poor sister or the Cinderella of the actual European Convention of Human Rights, so much so, and I know I, I'm, <laughs> I'm indulging my own self here, so much so that about 10 years ago, the European Court of Human Rights, albeit a lower panel, said, the question whether segregated education exists is purely a matter of the prerogatives of local policy makers, not even a question that states have to answer for. So I think that hopefully gives you the answer. Now it's changing. There are a number of groups bringing test cases before the European Court to try and nudge it toward a deeper understanding of equality that our American brothers and sisters have. I guess uh, inalienable rights trumps uh, in the US context. Okay, uh, everyone now has the inalienable right to coffee and tea. Um, and I expect that you'll all come back at 11.15 for continuation. Thank you.